The Democrats are gaslighting us Republicans by forcing issues that divide us, whether it's Ukraine or whether it's, uh, um, you know, continuing the budget, etc. They do that intentionally as a as a way for them to collectivize themselves against us and divide us. We need to change the law. And I know it's just not right that uh, one minute someone can be a sitting congressman and then they go away for six weeks and come back as a representative for, for the military industrial complex. So we have a completely wide open border. We have fentanyl poisoning more Americans than at any time in our history. My wife and I lost our son, Joey, April 15th of 2022. Uh, and unfortunately, this is a story that's just becoming way too common. We lost him to fentanyl poisoning. Just about everybody that I talk to has somehow been affected by Biden's border crisis. It has real life consequences for families all across the country. All right, guys, it is Wednesday. I love hump day. It's just, there's something about getting over the the middle of the week and then sliding into the weekend, especially this, this holy week as we head into uh, to Easter, time with family. I'm excited, I don't know. Uh, and obviously a lot going on in politics. We're still monitoring the recovering effort in, uh, in the Baltimore area. It's what these first responders did, by the way, when you hear the Mayday call come in and within two minutes, the cops are stopping traffic. The, the amount of lives they saved, unbelievable. God bless them. Um, and, uh, they're saying that up to six people lost their lives who are working on the bridge that couldn't get off. And I, I can't imagine what those families feel like right now. So our thoughts and prayers continue to be with them. Um, but a lot going on in politics. First, before I do that, because of you guys, we are about 200 people subscribers short of a hundred thousand for this show on YouTube alone. Please make it my Easter gift. Help us get to 100,000 ASAP. Whatever you guys are doing the last 48 hours has been amazing. Marjorie Taylor Greene killed it last night, by the way. Thanks for everyone who tuned in last night. Um, go to YouTube, Rumble, everywhere else. Hit the subscribe, but just hit subscribe now and share it. If you're on, send it to five people saying, I love watching Sean's show every night. It's free. Just click subscribe for me. That's awesome. Um, it'll be... It, Anyway, it's, it's great for me. It's great for the sponsors. And I appreciate everything you guys are doing. This growth is because of you and what you're doing to spread the show. I love doing the Sunday Night Lives. Anyway, um, look, today I've got four candidates on the, on the show. Two veterans in battleground states, Arizona and Michigan, and then uh, two more in, in Indiana and Alabama. We have a one-seat majority right now. That's what we're about to. These are the folks that are critical in growing this. Why does that matter to you if you don't live in one of those states? Because if we don't have a Republican House, President Trump isn't going to get his agenda through. Not only not his agenda, you saw last time, in two years, they impeached the guy twice. Investigation, investigation, investigation. Having a Republican House, having a robust Republican House is critical. No matter where you live, these races are important. The first real race that I got paid for was in 1994. On election night, we lost by two votes. After a partial BS recount, we lost by 21. In 2000, I won a race by 386 votes. Getting the vote out matters. Understanding what it takes to win matters. Mechanics matter. So I want you guys to hear from these candidates right from them what they're doing to win, what their priorities will be, how much help they're getting or not. So we're going to get into that in a second. The first two I have, uh, Tom Barrett is an army guy. I can't, well, I got to, this is my way of being bipartisan. I have army people on. Tom is a helicopter pilot. He's running in Michigan. Dr. Zudi Jasser is from Arizona. Two battleground states, both held by Democrats. I'm going to talk to them shortly. And then we'll bring in Jason Carrier from Indiana and Dick Brubaker from Alabama. First, we're going to start it off with Tom Barrett from Michigan and Dr. Uh, Zudi Jasser of Arizona. Again, both of those states, battleground states that Trump has to win, Michigan and Arizona, and they are in seats held by Democrats. This is huge to getting back that majority. Before we get to them, I do want to tell you about two of the amazing sponsors that make this show possible and free because of your support and their sponsorship of the show. Let's hear from them. Then we'll get into it with Tom Barrett and Dr. Zudi Jasser. 
All right, if you're an animal lover like I am, I want to tell you about the great work of Delta Rescue. And if you go to deltarescue.org, you can check it all out right there. There's great videos. They show you what they do. It's a no-kill sanctuary. Notice that I didn't say shelter. Animal lovers, you used to go to the shelter to rescue, right? Leo Grillo founded Delta Rescue as a no-kill sanctuary for life that dogs, cats, horses, and other animals can get the care that they need the veterinary care, the nutrition care, as a place to run free, to enjoy the rest of their lives. But Delta Rescue only exists because of the contributions of people like you and me. $5, $25, $100, $1,000, a couple thousand, whatever you can spare if you're an animal lover. But more importantly, Leo Grillo, when he founded it, wanted it to be an enduring mission, something that went on well into the future. And to do that, we're asking people to check out deltarescue.org and go to the estate planning kit. So if you can make a contribution, great. But also go to the estate planning kit and see if you can make Delta Rescue part of your estate to help make sure that that mission endures forever. Go to deltarescue.org, check out the great work that they do, make a contribution, and then download that estate planning kit to see if you can make it part of your estate. When crisis hits, when an emergency hits, will you be prepared? I know I will, because I have a Patriot Power Generator 2000X in my house. And you can too if you go to fourpatriots.com slash Spicer. fourpatriots.com slash Spicer. When the power goes out, whether that's a day, a couple days, a few weeks, maybe even a month, think about all the challenges that we face to our power grid, natural disasters and emergencies, you want to be ready. And with the Patriot Power Generator 2000X, you can power your refrigerator, devices, computers, tablets, phones, you name it. All the things that are important to you, your family, that can be taken care of. And you can bring the Patriot Power Generator into your house. No fumes, no gas, no noise. It's perfect. It's portable and it charges on solar panels that come free with it. You don't have to worry about reloading it, bringing out gas, getting it filled, the fumes, the noise, no. The Patriot Power Generator is fully portable. It can go into your house. You can put it in your car, drive it somewhere, helping out a family friend. And again, it's completely powered by solar panels that come with it. So go to fourpatriots.com slash Spicer so that you are ready in an emergency or crisis. All right, gentlemen, good to see you. I wanted to start this panel off with you because A, you're veterans, and B, you both are in seats held by Democrats. Uh, I'm going to start, because I can, with the Navy guy. Uh, Zudi, uh, let me ask you, how important do you think military service is in your race when you talk to people? Uh, I can't tell you how important it is. Uh, Americans uh, feel that we're at siege, our house is on fire. They don't want people that are get on a, are going to get on-the-job training. They want uh, folks uh, like myself and, and, and many other candidates that are veterans that uh, are able to hit the ground running, having not only served our country uh, abroad and uh, domestically, but also having been vetted. You know, I've not only served as a naval officer, but I have been countering radical Islam domestically and globally on many fronts, uh, running into the fire, running against the Islamist, uh, and calling out the Democratic Party for its radicalization long before anybody knew what wokeism was and uh, what cancellation was. I was being canceled from universities because I was courageous enough to stand up against the Muslim Brotherhood, against the alphabet soup of uh, radical Islamic groups. So uh, having served a community, not only in the military, but as part of organizations and otherwise running into the fire, our, our American community, our citizens, our constituents want people that have served to fix the problems because we should be a country of hope. And the biggest problem I see, Sean, is apathy. People are so yeah. concerned that there just aren't good candidates out there. Tom, you couldn't serve in the Navy for whatever reason, so you chose the Army, which is acceptable. Um, but but when you talk around, you, you've expanded that. You've really done a lot of work with veterans. Uh, you know, Zudi was right. I mean, very few people now have a connection to the military. We're seeing fewer and fewer people, 1%, I think, serve in this country or have a connection. Do you think there's a disconnect when you talk to people? Are they excited about your service? Is that a big issue that you bring up? Yeah, I mean, it's arguably uh, my the biggest biographical point that I'm the most proud of is my service in the military and in the army. I will remind you the prevailing winning football team in the <laughs> most recent uh, army Navy football game, just yeah. to settle that score. Um, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I joined the army as, as a teenager. I, I had never even been on an airplane in my life until I took uh, a flight to basic training just uh, a couple of weeks after I graduated from high school and 
That began the greatest adventure of my life that continued for 22 years, eventually was selected to go to flight school and learn to fly some amazing helicopters that I really really could have only had the opportunity to do in the so, army. And, do you uh, think do you think that, you know, you, you talk about helicopters and, and the age of a lot of our equipment, yeah. whether it's the ships, the planes, the helicopters. I mean, it's and I, it's funny when you talk to people, at least when I talk to people, they'll, they'll be like, they'll look at the dollar size of how much money the Department of Defense is getting and say, oh, well, it's, it's plenty funded. And you go, you know how much a ship costs? Do you know how much a plane costs? <laughs> do you think that people understand? I mean, I look at China in particular. And I go, we're not even close to, to matching the threat that we face. Yeah, that is a huge issue. And national security is a major platform issue for me, in large part due to my experience in the Army and just seeing the uh, near-peer adversaries, as we would identify them, China, Iran, and others on the globe that really present a adversarial threat to the United States. I think it's part of what separates me from my opponent. He's a career politician never served a day in his life in any branch of service, although he'll, you know, put on an army uniform jacket on Veterans Day to suggest that he is and, you know, has never served in any branch of service. But laying that aside, I think this national security background that I have clearly differentiates me from my opponent and is something that I want to bring more attention to is the threats that we're facing from these near peer like adversaries that we're seeing advance around the globe due to weakness in the White House, as well as you know, unpreparedness uh, through the through the current you know ranks that we have in the military. You look at what happened in the withdrawal from Afghanistan and our adversaries that were watching that, and then the downstream, you know, second and third order effects of that that we've seen and witnessed that I think yeah. need to be addressed, need to be accounted for, and need to be um, challenged. And that's a big part of why I'm running for Congress. Zuni, Arizona, I mean, in Texas, are at the forefront of the border crisis. You have a plan that you put out on your website on how you would address this. It's funny, when President Biden talks about it, he acts like, if Congress doesn't act, there's nothing I can do. As somebody who sees the issue of illegal immigration up front, what, what do you say to people who might be a little bit further removed from the border in terms of A, the threat it faces, and B, what we can be doing without maybe Congress having to do act, if you will? Well, you know, our eight point plan, as you mentioned, is a realistic prescription. And, you know, so many people are calling for, you know, just calling out the problem. But yet, do we have solutions? We need leadership that can call out solutions. And our eight point plan, we're only 200 miles from the border, as you said. Families I talk to as we go door to door in Tempe and Mesa, you know, tell me, uh, it's it's not just the the hemorrhaging border, but the crime that comes with it, the fentanyl, yeah. the 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 lawlessness that's destroying our neighborhoods, the consumption of resources in our hospitals. As a doctor, I can't tell you the amount of unfunded care that's happening in our state that we just can't afford. As our as our citizens can't even make ends meet because of Bidenflation and the suppression of small businesses and others. Our eight point plan is something the Congress can do. Number one is seal the border. Two is reclaim congressional constitutional authority rather than have the executive basically dominated. This is congressionally run. It should, we should take back that authority. And as an activist, I've been battle vetted, battle tested in the order in, in, in countering the Democrats in Washington, having testified many times to Congress. And we need an activist in Congress, not just this uh, lifetime politician of Greg Stanton or others. And, you know, I have a primary to win and I can tell you my primary opponents are great, but, you know, they're really not battle vetted, battle tested. They have nothing out there as far as solution. I call for the deport deportation of Biden's illegals, the millions in just the last few years, the uh, uh, ending of sanctuary cities uh, uh, legally through our uh, uh, congressional authority and the use of the bully pulpit of activism where members of Congress have just been too silent on you, the realities of a hemorrhaging border. So, so let me ask you that. You watched Congress, I had Marjorie Taylor Greene on the show yesterday. Congress passed this massive 1,000 page bill to fund the rest of 2024. They didn't take a stand on border security. It was something that we were talking about yesterday. What, like at some point, what would you, would you have done anything different? 
Well, listen, I would I would say we can't pass anything until we stop the hemorrhaging. And uh, you might some might call that obstructionist. But the Democrats are gaslighting us Republicans by forcing issues that divide us, whether it's Ukraine or whether it's, uh, um, you know, continuing the budget, et cetera. They do that intentionally as a as a way for them to collectivize themselves against us and divide us. So we need to say, listen, I'm a primary care doc. Congress needs primary care in their body politic, and that is to deal with the cancer first, and then later the blood pressure and other things. And the cancer right now is border security, crime, the the uh, um, economy. Until we deal with these things, we say, listen, we're not doing our job. And I don't think there's an excuse to just sort of let the Democrats, when we run Congress, and that's why actually, Sean, our seat is so important here. This is a flippable seat that's now been redistricted yeah. and is D plus one barely. And at the end of the day, we are going to be able to flip these kind of seats because Americans are sick and tired of the division. And uh, those members of Congress that just sort of ignore their constituents and what's happening in our districts. Tom, you're in Michigan. What do you what is the issue of immigration mean for your people? Is it the fentanyl? Is it the concern about or, or and where does it rank for you? Yeah, uh, it's all of the above first, but it ranks as the foremost issue in this election this year. We have a completely wide open border. We have fentanyl poisoning more Americans than at any time in our history. We have a dereliction of duty by this administration to allow you know, eight or nine million plus illegal border crossings into this country just under Joe Biden's watch, which is nearly equal to the entire population of the state of Michigan. Every town in America, and certainly every town in Michigan is now a border community because of that. Tragically, just 45 minutes from where I'm joining you from today, we had a young woman who was just killed by an illegal immigrant who had been deported uh, by President Trump, who came back into the country and just killed a young woman, Ruby Garcia, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, just adjacent to where I am joining you today. And there is nothing, no action taken by this administration. Our president already has the tools within his control to secure the border if he chose to do that. Yeah. But instead, day one of his administration, what did he do? He halted any construction on border security whatsoever. I went down to McAllen, Texas and saw the border uh, wall panels that had already been shipped and placed laying on the ground because Joe Biden failed to allow them to even erect the remaining parts of the border structure that could be put in place very easily. He also reversed Title 42. He reversed the Remain in Mexico policy. All of these things that would enhance our border security that this president has lifted and then has the audacity to try and blame Republicans or members of Congress yeah. for not passing something else that would allow him to declare an emergency yeah. if more than 5,000 people a day were crossing our border. That's a, that is an absolutely absurd position. The American people know it. It's why you see his approval so low. And it's why we need to elect good people to Congress to confront this type of dereliction of duty. People can go to my website, TomBarrettForCongress.com, see more about that. And it's a absolutely mission critical part of what we have to do. Uh, to the doctor's point, you got to stop the bleeding when you're dealing with yeah. a casualty before you move on to the other issues of concern. And the bleeding that we are seeing is going on every single day without dispute at our southern border. And it's as clear and obvious for everyone to see. Let me let me shift to logistics, right? Because in order to do any of this, you have to win. Um, Doc, I want to start with you. Do you do you are you getting the resources and the attention that you need from the national apparatus? And I mean, because both of you come from swing states, we got to win Arizona. You know, you got eleven electoral votes there for Trump, and then in Michigan, you got the fifteen electoral votes. These are battleground states. It's not just your districts, which are both held by Democrats, that are critical. The states themselves. Doc, are you getting the the attention? Or is the NRCC, the National Republican Congressional Committee, are they in touch with you guys? Are they saying, "Hey, I know you got to get a primary, but then we're we're with you, and here's what the the turnout operation is going to look like." You know, listen, uh, thankfully, I've uh, been working at a national platform on uh, national security and on health care for uh, 10 to 20 years. So uh, I have that that I have hit the ground running. Uh, and certainly uh, we have national endorsements from Charlie Kirk to Senator Kyle, Hugh Hewitt, uh, Glenn Beck and others that have endorsed my candidacy. So uh, we are hitting the ground running. Yeah, Could but it be is better? the party coming in? I mean, like 
There, this yeah. is, I, I get it. I've been doing congressional campaigns for 30 years. Is, are, are, are the, is the National Party saying this is an opportunity to take a Dem seat and put it in a Republican colleague? We will be there to help you. Are they, are they been in contact? We met with them. We met with the NRCC. Right. They were very positive. I could not tell you that the, the meeting could not have gone any better than it did. But I will tell you, with the switch of speakers just a few months ago and, and uh, a lot of the turnover in staff, uh, they're still, I think they're months behind. I mean, I'm a first time candidate. So the experts tell me that we, we are talking to them at a at a scale where we they should be last summer. Now we're in the election year and uh, we're told to sort of look into May and June uh, for more clarity as far as uh, how to get our packages together to get national. And as you said, every campaign, especially the seats that we, we can help gain seats uh, is a national campaign and, and you can't get the resources just within only within the district that has yeah. to be national because the Democrats are doing the same on their side. Yeah, I mean, the, you guys represent two seats that are critical, not just to President Trump, but to winning. And in, and in Zudi's case, I mean, th this is, you got Trump, Carrie Lake in the Senate, and then, and then these congressional races. And then Tom, in Michigan, are you guys seeing the, 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 the support that you need? Are they talking to you? Are they saying, we'll be here? Here are the resources that we're going to funnel in? Yeah, I mean, we have had a uh, a very um, very good relationship with the NRCC in this race. In fact, uh, uh, Chairman Hudson, Richard Hudson, has identified this as the number one Republican pickup seat opportunity that we have nationally this year. Part of that is due to the fact that this is an open seat that I am running in. The current incumbent is running for the U.S. Senate, so that makes this an open seat, one that is an R plus two district. One that we are, so, but it's held. It's held by a Democrat, Elisa Slotkin. Yeah. She's running for the Senate. So if you pick it up, it's still a flip. It's a flip seat opportunity, and one that we have to move on the ledger sheet over to our column. You've seen the Democrats challenging district lines in other states that are going to claw back some of the seats that we gained in the last election. Open seats like this and flip seat opportunities in Arizona and other states are of critical importance for us to have a majority to reverse the disaster of the Biden administration in this seat where I'm running the Michigan 7th Congressional District is absolutely ground zero for that. I am fortunate that I don't have any primary opposition and we are laser focused on the November general election because we have to win this seat. I, I remind people, in America, we don't have a lot of last chances left. Unfortunately, we, we, we've used a lot of them up already and this truly is our last remaining chance to hold on to this republic and begin to turn our country around. For yeah, the look, I, look, I got to say this just for everyone watching this. Like these two guys, this is where it's at. You got veterans in battleground states that can flip seats. I mean, this is this is the trifecta of what we need, right? This is good candidates in key areas. Uh, I mean, so these are the guys that we need to on, on the front lines who we need to support to give President Trump a, a house. The last question I want to ask both of you, and I'll, I'll start with you, Doc. Uh, Election integrity is an issue that's big for so many voters this cycle. Obviously, as I've said over and over again, both of you are in battleground states, Arizona big, Carrie Lake made it a big issue. For the voter who's out there right now and saying, "Do is my vote going to count? What should I do? How do I get involved? What is your answer to that? I would tell them, listen, as a son of immigrants that escaped Syria and, and dictatorships that are the worst places in the, pan, uh, in the world for any freedom, where the election results are known before the first ballot is cast and you're, you're oppressed and tortured if you vote any other way, I can tell you that uh, there's nobody that appreciates election integrity more than I do in my family. And uh, listen, there's a lot of transparency work that needs to be done. Uh, but if there's anything I can do as a federally elected uh, uh, congressman is make sure that that stays locally, that stays with the states and that the federal government stay out of the way of our localities for for demanding transparency and election integrity. But until 2018, the Republicans owned the early balloting. And then somehow yes. we lost that. We need to get back to, you know, listen, making sure that the system uh, is clear, is transparent, is fair and, and demanding that from our bully pulpits. And I will do that. But we can't surrender that at the expense of letting the collectivists that are doing illegal things, ballot harvesting, all this other stuff. And, you know, Places like Turning Point, organizations like them are doing a lot on the ground to make sure that we get the vote out. And that's what we need to do is move forward with hope, transparency, but get the federal government out of the way for localities. Tom, how, how are things in Michigan when it comes to election yeah. integrity? 
Uh, Michigan recently adopted a constitutional amendment that allows for early in-person voting in Michigan. So people who may have a hesitation around sending their ballot back through the mail can go in person and actually scan their ballot through the tabulator on one of the early voting days here in Michigan. We are going to do a full court press for absentee ballots that are going to be sent through the mail as well as early voting and election day because we have to have every combined effort to win this race. People who have a concern and certainly want to get involved, they can go to my website, TomBarrettForCongress.com, sign up as a volunteer, and we can help plug you in to your local election officials to volunteer as a poll watcher, a challenger, whatever other uh, whatever other issue that you may be interested in or available to do. Uh, I care, like Doc, I care a lot about election integrity as well. I was in the state legislature and sponsored the bill that requires our clerks in Michigan to issue paper ballots instead of just relying on those touchscreen machines that you can never go back and trace the legitimacy of the source data with. These are things that are important. We were able to get that bill signed into law, but there's a lot of work left to be done, but we have to win this election. Yes. We're going to need everybody involved to be able to do that. All right, gentlemen, good luck. We'll check back in with you. Thanks for being here and sharing all of this. Go Navy. <laughs> Go <Thank> Army. <laughs> all right. That was a great conversation with those two guys. As I told you, amazing because they are critical to growing the majority, not just holding it, growing it. I loved their discussion about the support that they're getting or not. We're going to keep an eye on that. Next, I want to bring in Jason Car Jameson Carrier uh, from Indiana and Dick Brubaker from Alabama about what their races are, the issues, and the compelling story that Jameson has about why he got into this race. If you're like me and looking to secure your financial future, then I want you to do me a favor. Call my friends at Bishop Gold, 844-984-1616, or go to bishopgoldgroup.com slash Sean and have a conversation with them or check out the materials on the website, bishopgoldgroup.com slash Sean, about how you can add precious metals to your investment strategy. Maybe you have an old 401k, an IRA, or you're just looking to diversify your investment strategy. I called them, I had a conversation about where I am in my financial planning, how we could add financial metals to my strategy, right? So I invested my money with them. You get hit up from a lot of groups, all over. I see it every day when I watch TV or I'm online. I trust the people at Bishop Gold Group. They're full of integrity, knowledge about the industry, about investments and strategies. Call them and help them create a strategy that works for you based on the assets that you have. Again, maybe it's an old 401k or an IRA that you have sitting there that they can help you do it. You can talk to them about holding on to the metals. They can liquidate them for you. They can hold on to them for you. But call Bishop Gold Group, 1-844-984-1616, or go to bishopgoldgroup.com slash Sean to begin your financial journey with Precious Metals, and you get a free gift. All right, gentlemen, thank you both for being here. Um, I, I want to talk about what First and foremost, what, what you guys see as the, the biggest issue that you're facing in your race? Jameson, I, I know um, the fentanyl crisis is very personal for you and your family. Um, talk to us about how that issue has affected you and, and how you're running your campaign on that. Absolutely. Yeah. So for my wife and I lost our son, Joey, April 15th of 2022. Uh, and unfortunately, this is a story that's just becoming way too common. We lost him to fentanyl poisoning. And uh, as we travel the district, just about everybody that I talk to has somehow been affected by Biden's border crisis. And our adversaries are poisoning our children. It has real life consequences for families all across the country. And it's very personal for us. And how did how did you manifest this into wanting to run? I mean, I, I can't. I can't get my head around what that must be like as a parent, um, as a father. And it's how do you? Yeah, it's something that, you know, I'll tell you what, I met with a mentor as I was dealing through, you know, all of these issues and, and how it affects our family. And he said something that I'll never forget. He said, most people think that hate is the opposite of love. Yeah. He said, apathy is the opposite of love. And so we love deeply. So you have to put your love into action. Wow. I, I mean, God bless you for that. I, I just, I, I get it. I agree with you. But it, I mean, sometimes saying something like that is easy. Doing it is another. And for you to take this strategy, turn it around and want to go serve people in Congress, I, God bless you for it. Dick, um, 
I mean, how you guys are down there closer to the southern border in Alabama. How much does this issue factor into how you're running your race and how much people, not just you're running your race, but when you go out there and you're talking to people at a chamber of commerce or walking down the street, do people come up there and, and where does that issue, you, you know, you heard Katie Britt, right? When she gave that Republican response, she was talking about it on a very personal level. How does it manifest itself for you on the campaign trail? Well, in South Alabama, I don't think it's very different from Indiana. Uh, Everywhere we go, people talk about two things. They talk about the border and they talk about inflation. And the reason they talk about the border is because of fentanyl. And, you know, you've got young people that are not habitual drug users. I mean, 200 Americans a day are dying of fentanyl poisoning, every bit of which comes through Mexico. And the Chinese make the precursor chemicals, the Mexican cartels turn it into fentanyl. And if the Russians or the Chinese were killing 200 Americans a day, we'd be at war. Yep. But we've got a president in office who is allowing this to go on and doesn't seem to think it's an issue. If it wasn't for Narcan, it'd probably be 2,000 people a day. I mean, this is a, this is a murderous drug. And the Americans that it's killing are not, for the most part, habitual drug users. A kid at a college buys a pill he thinks is Adderall, and it turns out to be laced with fentanyl, and he ends up in an emergency room or worse. And the president has all the authority he needs to put a stop to it and just refuses to do it. And the border and inflation are the two things people in South Alabama seem to be most concerned about. Jameson, uh, Dick saying the border and education, I've always tried to say that sometimes there are issues that come up in an area of the country that don't necessarily resonate nationally. Are there issues that you're seeing in Indiana that pollsters aren't talking about, that pundits aren't talking about, something that's unique maybe to Indiana or or an industry there? You know what? I, I think we're facing the same things all across our country right now. I don't think there are a whole lot of things that are unique. I mean, of course, we're a rural district. We have farmers and we're very concerned about that. But when it comes to it, uh, I I mean, you've nailed it. It is absolutely, it's the border. It's the fentanyl crisis. It's inflation. It's the economy. And those are the things that are so simple to fix. We've got to put America first. And we've got to work with President Trump to build the wall. We've got to give our border patrol agents the tools that they need to do their job effectively. And, you know, all of this stuff is readily available to us. And unfortunately, uh, President Biden has chosen not to do it. And since he's been in office, there have been more people that we've tracked that have crossed the border that we know of than the entire population of our state of Indiana. It is completely out of control. And uh, we, yeah, there's no question. We're facing the same things. Every town is a border town in Biden's America. Dick, you know, in the last couple of months in Congress, Ken Buck from Colorado, he called it quits. Uh, Bill Johnson from Ohio, he called it quits. And then last week, Mike Johnson and Mike Gallagher from Wisconsin, the chair of the China Select Committee, he said, not only am I not running for reelection, I'm leaving Congress early. All these guys are running for the hills. Why do you want to run towards Washington? You know, I've got five boys and five grandchildren. This is the country they're going to grow up in. You can't give up on it. And this is fixable. I mean, so many people think that uh, the problems are so big, they just cannot be fixed. It's hard, but it's not all that complicated. We just have to have the will to save this country. And putting America first, uh, as my future colleague here just said, is the key to it all. I mean, we don't have to strangle our own energy production while China burned more coal last year than in any year in their history. I mean, we can lower inflation. We can put American families first. We can secure the border. We can stop this fentanyl from poisoning our society. And, you know, it can be done, but we're just going to have to elect people who want to do it. And that, uh, and I think first and foremost right now, that means Donald Trump. So Jameson, I, I, I really what, what Dick just said resonates, right? Because to me, I think what, what, what's lacking right now more than anything in Washington is, is courage. The ability to stand up and say, no more to China. We're going to stop just letting them roll over us economically, militarily, et cetera. We're going to actually stand up and fight for the border. 
Uh, we're going to look at the debt. I mean, the debt keeps growing. Every Republican scratches their head and goes, yeah, we're spending too much money and then votes uh, to allow a 1,000 page monstrosity of a bill flow through. There is no, I don't think, any sense of fiscal discipline anymore. What What is it that you sort of say, here are the qualities that I'm going to bring to Washington. Here's what I'm, the hills that I'm willing to die on. Yeah, absolutely. I'll tell you what, I think we have way too many career politicians that are serving in Washington, D.C. today. I'm not a politician. I'm a businessman. I'm as much of an outsider as you could ever put out. I've never ran for any sort of public office. I think our founders had no even thought that there would be anything even remotely close to a career politician. I think they set it up to where people would leave their farm, their business, their law firm, whatever it is, and go and serve for a while and represent the people, defend the Constitution, and then get back to business. And I think what happens is, is the reason we're spending money like it's monopoly money is because people are more concerned about getting elected again than they are. I love what you said, it's courage. We don't have the courage to stand up and make the right decisions. And if we're going to give the American dream to the next generation, to your five boys, to, you know, to all of those that we wanna leave it to, we have six grandchildren. And we want them to have the same American dream, the same opportunity we did. If we're going to have to do that, we're going to need to make the decisions to get our, our budget balanced and, uh, and, and, and pass this on to the next generation. You know, Dick, um, as Jameson was talking, I'm thinking to myself, that's got to be music to your ears. You were a two-term state senator. You pledged when you ran to only serve two terms. And oh my God, you kept your word. Uh, um, where do you come down on what he just said about career politicians and people going to Washington? Oh, it's an absolute bullseye. It's exactly that. We have two problems, career politicians and this revolving door between Congress and lobbying. And if you want to clean up the Republic, uh, we need term limits, especially in the people's house, especially in Congress. And we need to change the law. And I just, it's just not right that uh, one minute someone can be a sitting congressman and then they go away for six weeks and come back as a representative for, for <laughs> the military industrial complex. It's, you know, this, uh, it, it corrupts the democracy because let's face it, those congressmen that have become lobbyists, their last term in Congress, they were thinking about, now is this vote going to make Con Agra more or less likely to hire me as a lobbyist when I retire. And it's, it's a corrupting influence and yeah. we need term limits. And I've already said, I've signed the term limits that I'll vote for a term limits bill and that I won't serve more than 10 years if the voters will give me that long. Jameson, what, would you agree with that? Absolutely. We've done the same thing. We've signed the really? term limits pledge. Thank yes. You. Yes. We need more, more people running for office that are willing to do that. And that's one of the first things we did when we started our campaign is to sign that term limits pledge. You know, it's funny though, what, what Dick brings up though, the second piece of that, and I think part of it is I'm a volunteer believer. Like I think what you guys, if you sign your name on this, like I, I'm, I think if people voluntarily want to limit their terms and they want to make it a big deal, like I, I like that better than a law, but that's a separate discussion. But I think the separate point that, that Dick made about not going to profit off the office is also a bigger one. And that's the other thing is, do you think that we should start asking members who are running, will you agree that you won't be a lobbyist when it's all done? Absolutely. <laughs> yes, we're both saying amen to that. Uh, it's it's <laughs> It turns I mean, in, I, you know, Dick, I think that the, it was funny, though, you put it in a really fascinating way, which is that last term, if you know you're leaving or you've announced you're leaving, then you're starting to think the whole time, where's my contract coming from? Where's my lobbying bill going to get paid? All that stuff. But if you know that you've pledged that you can't do it or you're going home to Alabama or Indiana, then that's not top of mind anymore. And you're actually going to continue to be a, a servant. Yeah. Who are you sending people when we vote for people? my constituents expect me to represent them. And if the back of my mind, the whole time I'm in Congress says, I'm going to turn this into a high paying lobbying job when I get out, you know, it's, it's going to change the way I vote. And that's just wrong. And a, a very simple change in federal law and we could fix it. But I don't see so far among Republicans or Democrats, uh, a whole lot of will to slam shut the door to a corporate lobbying office. But yeah. it's something that has to happen if we want our democracy to function. 
Uh, I want to switch to, to I, I asked the other candidates that I had on earlier, and so I want to switch this discussion to the logistics piece, right? So you can't actually do anything until you get elected. And when you to get elected, you got to run a great campaign. Mechanics matter. You got to get out the vote. Jameson, you, you know, you mentioned that you're not a career politician. What have you learned about raising money, building a campaign, um, getting out, doing a get out the vote effort? What, what have you learned in this process about that whole piece of the campaign? Uh, so much, so much. And I'm learning, I, I wouldn't say every day, I'm learning just about every minute. And, <laughs> I, you know, we've been supporters of, of campaigns for candidates that we believed in for some time, but I still, I don't think I realized how vital it is. Uh, it, it gives you that momentum. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's exciting to see that, you know, people will come on board and, you know, people will, will, will write a big check and that's great. But sometimes the best uh, donation you get is that $25 donation from somebody that says, look, I don't have money, but I want you to know that I'm behind you. And that person's going to vote for you. They're going to get others to vote for you. And uh, yeah, I mean, it, it is it's vital. That's carrierforcongress.com, by the way. <laughs> good for you. I, good for, you know what? You got to apply. Good for you. This is why it's, you know, get people to get on board. That's smart, smart move. Um, you know, Dick, you, you were, as I mentioned, two-term state senator. Is there anything different about running for Congress than running for the state Senate that you have realized that you thought you might have been prepared for that you weren't? Well, it's a lot more expensive to run for Congress <laughs> than it was to run, uh, for, as a state senator. And the other thing is, you know, you've got, when I ran as a state senator, I didn't have people from out of state walking in and saying, uh, we'll give you a lot of money, but we want your word that you're going to vote this way. And, you know, I'll be honest with you. And for a congressional election, if you're not eligible to vote for the candidate, I'm not so sure you should be able to donate to the campaign because there's a lot of pressure from interests way outside South Alabama who are trying to get me to commit to things. And I'm just not doing it. And you, well, give me an example. If you're watching this right now, that's such a great point. Give me an example. Like who, who is, what would be an example of an outside interest saying, hey, we want to support you, but we need to know X. Oh, Club for Growth. I mean, okay. I'm, I like free trade, but I'm not going to on the front end in exchange for money, promise you votes on specific issues because a, I'm not in Congress yet. I haven't seen the actual bill, and I don't know how it will affect District Two. And but that's the deal. I mean, you know, they lay down a, a a set of positions, very specific positions, and they want your name on a dotted line. And it's uh, and I'm just not doing it. And if you don't agree to that that list of uh, of issues, then what, they just say, we're not, we're not going to play in your race or we're not going to support you. Well, that's where, I mean, that's where they are in a primary, certainly. Right. I mean, I don't know what they're going to do in the general, but, uh, I'm not, you know, one thing I did learn in the state legislature, you know, you can talk about issues, but until you when it comes down to an actual bill, uh, you better read it before you commit to it. <laughs> and, uh, and that's, and that's the problem with some of these, uh, these groups, they're so specific. And, uh, you know, like in the last farm bill, there was everything but farming in it. So, uh, you know, I'm going to read bills before I commit to how I'm going to vote on them. But, but, you know, Jameson, to that point, the bill that just got passed over the weekend, they gave them 24 hours to read a 1,012 page bill that dealt with 70% of funding government. How, how do you walk in and say, what, what are you willing to, you know, we talked about courage. Are you going to be one of the guys that is willing to say, nope, no, I'm not going to allow that to happen? Well, again, I, I think to Dick's point, every situation is unique, right? So we have to look at this on a case by case basis. One of the things I'm grateful for is that when you get to Congress, you can surround yourself with a great team. Yeah. And that's something that's going to be vital, especially to me. I'm an outsider. And I think there's, and you know, we've seen that traveling across our district is there's a, there's a real hunger. There's a desire to elect outsiders, but you know, there, there are some things that you've got to learn as well. And so, you know, the first order of business, if I'm elected is going to be to hire the very best team that I can surround myself with people so that we can look at this stuff with an educated, uh, you know, eye and know what we're, what we're doing. And, and, you know, those are things, again, we're going to have to decide in the heat of the battle sometimes. 
Yeah. James and Dick, thank you guys for being with us. And, and I think what I loved about this conversation is you really pulled back the veil as far as what it's, what it's like to run and the challenges that you face. And I think that's important for people to understand as we head into this crucial cycle. Best of luck to you out on the campaign trail. God bless. And I hope to see you both in Washington soon. Thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, you bet. All right, folks, these are four great people that we met. I mean, the compelling story, how Jace Jameson turned that family tragedy into a mission to, to go out and run and serve. Unreal. The honesty that those guys have with the problems. These are guys that are going to govern with courage, and I love it. Tomorrow on the show, uh, new RNC chairman Michael Watley is going to join us. On Friday, chicks on the right. I'm excited. If you have a question for Michael Watley, let me know on social media. Go to the SeanSpicer.com or the SeanSpicerShow.com slash VIP and become a VIP member. Michael Watley, the new RNC chair, what are they doing differently? How are we going to win? You're not going to want to miss that. That's why you need to subscribe, YouTube, Rumble, Apple, Spotify, cover all your bases. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Well, if you enjoyed this content, make sure to like this video, subscribe and click the notification bell to get more.